listening to the Becoming Who You Are podcast, your guide to authentic living. Visit becomingwhoyouare.net for more resources, tools, and suggestions designed to help you create the life you want from the inside out. Now here's your host, Hannah. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this episode of the Becoming Who You Are podcast. My name is Hannah, and this episode is going to be slightly different to other episodes we've had. A couple of months ago, I posted a recording of a conversation I had with Jake, my partner, about a book called Getting Real by Susan Campbell, and that was part of something called the Psychology Book Club. This month, the Psychology Book Club met again, and we talked about The Six Pillars of Self-Esteem by Nathaniel Brandon. So in this episode, I want to share with you the recording of the Skype conversation we had about the book. I hope you find it useful and informative to listen to. If you're interested in finding out more about the book, you can find a link to its Amazon page in the show notes of this episode. As always, if you have any feedback about this episode or anything else to do with authentic living or becoming who you are, please email me at hannah, that's H-A-N-N-A-H, at becomingwhoyouare.net. Thanks so much for listening and I'll talk to you again next week. Hi everybody and thank you so much for coming to this month's Psychology Book Club call. Today we're going to talk about Six Pillars of Self-Esteem by Nathaniel Brandon. And so I would like to start by asking everyone um, what they thought of the book because I've definitely got quite a few thoughts on my own. Um, But I thought I'd start off the conversation by just, yeah, just saying what what were your impressions of the book? What was your experience of reading it? Well, uh, can I start off with my thoughts? Yeah, absolutely. Go for it. Cool. Yeah. Well, first off, um, I've I've actually had some trouble reading Nathaniel Brandon's books in the past. Mm-hmm. Um, I felt a lot of resistance, specifically reading the Psychology of Self Esteem. Um, but this time around, with Six Pillars of um, Self Esteem, I found it to be sort of pretty educational and very like empowering in a sense because of all the practical steps that are like that Nathaniel sort of provides in the book yeah Um, so I found it to be a pretty enriching book um and I think I I need to dig in more there are some things that I found problematic and I'd be interested to hear what you guys have to say about it but overall Mm -hmm. I found it to be um a good book and I I like reading it Great. Yeah, I, I echo your thoughts about the, the practical steps involved. I really like the little exercises that he provided at the end of each chapter, because especially talking about something like self-esteem, um, it was really useful not only to have the theoretical side of things, but also to have stuff that you could take away and do in your own time as well. So, yeah, I, I agree. I really like that. Exactly. Yeah. This is Jake here. I just wanted to say uh, I, I agree that I have read... Um, The Psychology of Self-Esteem a while ago, and I preferred uh, The Six Pillars of Self-Esteem. I found this book to be one where he talks a lot more personally about his own struggles to achieve more um, sort of integrity and all of the other pillars of self-esteem that he talks about. And he has, it's a more personal book, I think. He he talks about um, his own difficulties, whereas The Psychology of Self-Esteem was a little bit more written uh, from a perspective of like you know i am i am the master of self esteem and this is how you can how you can learn from me and i think that probably also reflects where he was in his life because when he wrote the psychology of self esteem um he was uh that was during the period where he was working with iron rand and he was also in a relationship with iron rand and and he had like this nathaniel brandon institute and stuff and i think he was Uh, when he wrote Six Pillars, it was later, and he'd uh, broken with Ayn Rand, and I think he'd had a lot of difficulties in his life. And so I found the book to be a bit more um, human, I suppose, and a bit more, uh, it felt felt like a more honest book in a way. Yeah, I think there was more humility in it. That's what struck me. Because I I also read The Psychology of Self-Esteem quite a few years ago now, but at the time I found it quite heavy going it wasn't quite what I, I I did definitely get some useful things out of it but it wasn't quite what I was hoping for and I think what I was really hoping for at the time was the six pillars of self-esteem mm. did anyone else have any thoughts that they wanted to share to begin with 
I always hate this kind of criticism when I hear it from other people. Nevertheless, I'm, I'm going to engage in it. <laughs> I, and that is to um, compare the book to another of his works and say, I didn't like it as much as this. I, I, but for me, um, his book, Honoring the Self, for some reason just absolutely unleashed a torrent of um, enlight or self-work in my in myself or, or self-realizations Great. that I didn't I didn't find in um, six pillars I although I think it was a matter of timing I read this mm. book um, at, at a during a time where I was heavily involved in IFS and some other sort of modalities so I, I could read it and I could see the, the um, importance of it and also its usefulness and in fact I did find it overall really great reading and I, I sort of saw it as man it, this would be such a gr-. I kept thinking of it as a, a like this would be such a fabulous framework for somebody who needs assistance like getting started if you will I'm not mm-hmm. sure if that's that comes across as a bit arrogant and I don't mean it that way I'm just saying it to me it was a very grounding book and it it was a great um, sort of a map for finding your own way yeah, so is is what you're you're saying that it sort of provides the foundations for exactly, building yes. a solid. Yes, and I thought the extra I did I really enjoyed like you, I, I wanted to echo, I really enjoyed the exercises as well. Talk about, you know, not being able to hide one iota. I thought those questions were were just uh, brilliantly framed. Mm, mm. Well, I'm really glad to hear that you liked honoring the self because I've actually got that um, queued up on my Kindle next. <laughs> oh, so I'm looking yes. forward to reading that next week. <laughs> I just felt very, it was a very, um, he came across as very empathetic in his passages on the differences between genuine self esteem and the sort of false self esteem, which is fabricated through, you know, wealth or good looks or power. Uh, just very, uh, I thought were just brilliantly articulated. Great. Well, thanks for sharing that. I was also about to say, just to kind of like agree with what uh, Jake and David were saying, that I, you can see a difference in Nathaniel Brandon's work, like over the span of his life. And it's sort of obvious, like when he's having a stronger pull on this sort of like Ayn Randy uh, direction. (laughs) And yeah, I mean, like, that was one thing that came out in, I guess, his his later works was like a lot more compassion, and I noticed that in this book too. Yeah, this is this is Brian. I I, I read it a, a little while back, and I thought what really shocked me was, I mean, because this is kind of an older book, and yet I thought like the particularly when he was talking about living consciously, and then later on when he talks about. Um, you know, living up to your full potential. Both of those I thought were so relevant now. In fact, I mean, like I enjoyed the examples that he gave in those in those areas, but they seemed, what was shocking to me was that I, I didn't understand like how people, like I, I'm thinking to back then, I'm like, people didn't, how did they have problems with like attention span, you know? As to where now I just see like constant uh, issues with attention span and thing, and you know, and, and living in the present like he talks about. And so I, I thought that was like just shockingly ahead of its time for a book. Um, so I, yeah, I, I thought that was great. I, f- I didn't feel like I spent as much time with the, the, the six pillars of self-esteem, but I did some of the exercises and it, this was a, a, a little while ago. So I, I have to try to sort of think about it a little bit more, but I, I would like to hear some more about when I have some thoughts, I'll share them. <laughs> that's okay. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's fine. Can I, it's, it's Jake here. I'd just be curious because we've also got um, lots of people on the call who uh, haven't um, taken part in the Psychology Book Club. And I'd just be really curious to know uh, where people are uh, based because it's kind of fun that uh, when we do this, there are people all over the world. Uh, so it's Jake here. I'm, I'm with Hannah and we're in uh, Mexico in Sayulita. So uh, oh, wow. who who else have we got on the call and, and where are you? No, I'm 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 Caroline. I'm I'm from Sweden. Awesome. Um and I'm Deborah and I'm in New York. Cool. And Claire's just typed in that she's in East London. And I'm Brian Matt's and here. Stephanie are in here Poland. in New Hampshire. Okay, so you got Brian we and Stephanie in New Hampshire and Matt in Poland. And Dave, you are in 
the belly of the beast, Washington, D.C. <laughs> great. great. <laughs> That's pretty international. That's awesome. Yeah, we've got a great spread today. Thanks for asking that, Jake. It's nice to know. Matt, did you have any thoughts that you wanted to share initially about the book? Uh, yeah, uh, it, it was in fact uh, the first the first uh, book t that I've read by Brandon, and it's uh, I see it as uh, this uh, basis, th this framework that I uh, th this. I'm glad that uh, I was able to read it and familiarize uh, myself with the stems and uh, that method method of work because. Uh, uh, later, I was able to work with uh, uh, Hannah's uh, stems and uh, those by Wes Bertrand, and I was I already had that uh, I I knew the idea and uh, how it is uh, it is supposed to work. So it was very uh, instructive, let's say, for me to uh, I I already knew what what. Uh, what that exercise is for, so it was uh, mm -hmm. way easier for me. And while I like uh, those stems by Brandon, I prefer those by Hannah and by Wes because I see them as more to the point as far as, as uh, my stuff goes. Like those by Brandon were a, a little bit too like beating around the bush uh, as, as far as my own personal stuff goes. and. Uh, the other two sets are more to the point, which makes me like like them better. But without Brandon's book, I wouldn't I I wouldn't be able to use them as well as I am able to. So these are my feelings about about this particular book. Great. Well, thank you so much for sharing that. And um, yeah, I feel really honored hearing what you said about about the sentence completion course that I offer. Um, I also, I've, I've done, Nathaniel Brandon offers sentence completion courses. I think he used to offer two and maybe it's just one now, but he offers them on his website. And I did them a couple of years ago. Um, in fact, I've gone through them a couple of times now. And I, I had a similar experience to you where some of them I found a little bit vague and I wasn't quite sure how to use them best or what to really do with them. Like. Um, the there were some sentences that said you know if i bring five percent more awareness to my life yeah. today and stuff like that and i can see how that could be useful but then he also said oh you know sentence completion you shouldn't overthink it and i was thinking but i don't really know what five percent more awareness just feels so vague to me it's like to what area exactly. of my life and <laughs> so yeah i can definitely relate to that i think that's really cool hearing from someone who's done hannah's course and uh yeah, I, I I can totally see how the sentence completion that you've uh, put together, Hannah, has sort of evolved. For, uh, and it's, I, I also find it more relevant than the ones that uh, Nathaniel Brennan offers. So well done. Great. Well, thank you for the feedback. You're welcome. I'll just read out a comment that Claire's put because um, her mic's not working. I would have to agree with Brandon, re self esteem being the cause of so many issues in people's society. I think when you are more self aware, you notice it in others more often. I mean, I work with women every day and I notice it a lot. Mm. I found his definitions to be very accurate um, in terms of self esteem and sort of getting down to the root of sort of like looking at our world and putting forth ideas that try to explain the causes of these sort of the ills in our world. Um, although he didn't use any like, well, actually, yeah, he used a lot of sort of anecdotal examples um, as of Jake said, and also just like bringing these kind of little stories that about how um, that are about his clients. I found those to be really helpful in that he was able to link, you know, the definitions that he puts forth in his book to sort of, to like real world um, things that we experience. And I found, you know, getting down to the sort of root of these kinds of things and having it in a book is really helpful. Uh, so that's, that's pretty, that's one of the most important things for me is just sort of getting that definitional sort of aspect from the book. 
Yeah, absolutely. I was going to bring this up later in the call, but I, one of the things that I really appreciated about it was that I think to a certain extent, or at least this is my perception anyway, is that in society at the moment, self-esteem is a little bit of a dirty word in the sense that there are a lot of people who have conflated it with grandiosity and um, narcissism as well. Um, I was reading a book recently by Kristen Neff called Self-Compassion, um, which is a really great book. I haven't completely finished it yet, but so far it's it's been great. But at the beginning, she sort of falls into that trap a little bit herself, where she starts talking about self-esteem um, and the self-esteem movement as promoting narcissism, essentially. And what I really like about um, the six pillars of self-esteem is it sort of feels like it's writing those misperceptions of what self-esteem is actually about and saying, no, it's, it's not about being perfect. It's just about being able to accept the way you are and have goals in mind and do whatever you can do to kind of live by your values um, and reach your fullest potential. Yeah, I think I was going to say, I think there is a big difference between um, the, the concept of self-esteem that he talks about in this book and, and in his other work and the way that the self-esteem movement went. And in fact, I remember in this book, he refers to his concerns about how the self-esteem movement has, has evolved. Mm. Um, because it, it, um, there is, in Nathaniel Brandon's view of self-esteem, there is a, a real emphasis on um, integrity and personal on responsibility. yeah personal responsibility and integrity, exactly. Whereas it seems like the self-esteem movement in general pushed a lot harder uh, emphasis onto self-acceptance mm. and probably to the detriment of some of the other pillars that he talks about in this book. So there are some versions of self-esteem as a concept which are very much about, you know, essentially accepting yourself kind of no matter what you do. Um, and it put the emphasis on that without the emphasis on actually, you know, living with integrity and self-responsibility. And so that's probably one where I think self-esteem has um, has been viewed as being associated with narcissism, is that if it is about, you know, I'm great no matter what I do, and I, I'll love myself sort of, you know, regardless of my actions, then it loses the self-responsibility of actually, uh, you know, being uh, responsible for what your actions are and, and, and looking honestly at whether or not you, you have integrity, which, which I think is a really important aspect of what Nathaniel Brandon was trying to get at. But obviously, it is possible to view self-esteem purely through a lens of self-acceptance. And when you do that, I think you lose out on that other side. Absolutely. I think it, the, one of the big takeaways from this book is that it's a question of balance and balancing all of the six pillars and not just focusing on one or two. So not just focusing on, um, you know, self-acceptance and self-assertiveness, for example, because if you just take those two, then you probably would fall into the category of what people conventionally call self, you know, self-esteem yeah. now, or the kind of workbooks that you get for self-esteem and everything. Um, Whereas what he emphasizes is taking all of the six pillars and focusing on them equally. Mm. And I think that's the magic recipe. Yeah, because if you leave out self-acceptance, you could go the other way and just become very much focused on, on li living by principles to the point at which you, be you can become incredibly self-critical yeah. if you fail in, you know, in any way to live up to your um, sort of... Uh, ideals of self-esteem so I think you can it, it, it's it's um bad to be unbalanced the other way too but it seems like the problem for is uh, that if you do focus on self-acceptance um it, it's a part of that kind of entitlement mentality like that oh I'm I'm great and everybody should should love me as much as I love myself even if without taking into account what my own responsibility is for my life you know mm. yeah and I think um just sort of to add something to what you were saying about the self-acceptance and how that can go out of balance. It's, I think fundamentally, if you don't have that sort of grounding in, in integrity and in the rest of the pillars, you're not going to achieve high self-esteem, like to the point that you can, because it's just, um, I think fundamentally, you know, um, this whole idea of our conscience, like we sort of know deep down what we're doing and it's, 
it's sort of like it's always going to be this uphill battle of trying to accept yourself even though you kind of keep doing the things that aren't right in a way yeah so it's it's fundamentally unsustainable yeah it reminds me of um i'm trying to think of what the exact saying is i'm this is going to be paraphrasing it. it's not really going to capture the essence of the <laughs> the original quote but there there's a quote that's gone around a few times now in places like facebook and everything and um it's something like i can't hear what what you're saying over what you're doing you know it's yeah. that, that whole thing about actions speak louder than words and um even if you're going around and you know proclaiming your self-acceptance and proclaiming your high self-esteem if you're not actually living that and if you're not you know living consciously living with purpose um, or living purposefully which are two of the pillars as well then people around you are going to realize and also in internally you're going to realize as well that actually no you 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 don't have um the foundations for high self-esteem and it's potentially even more damaging to you in the long run to do that and more damaging to your self-esteem because you know that you're not going to be living when you're doing that you're not living with integrity and i think the reason that he's able to um convey that idea without it being sort of him standing on his moral high ground as he was a little bit in um, the psychology of self-esteem is that in this book those are exactly the struggles that he talks about that he says like i was saying in the beginning he says a number of times like things that where his self-esteem suffered because of his actions and where he noticed that you know he hadn't really acted with integrity or taken responsibility for himself and i remember he talked i think he actually talks about the failure of his first marriage mm -hmm. and, uh, and the whole business with Iron Rand and stuff. And I thought that was really good that he's actually saying like, yeah, this is a work in progress always that, you know, I, I've had my own struggles with these things. And, and uh, that uh, to me made it a lot more um, kind of accessible as a book because it wasn't just kind of like, hey, if you want to be a self-esteem God like me, then do this, <laughs> you know? Yeah, absolutely. Another thing I really appreciated was the... Um, the final chapters of the book and it, it is a bit of a running joke in the psychology book club that when we read these books it's great up until the last chapter and inevitably 99% of the time whatever book you're reading whatever it's about the author will take everything they've been talking about which has been really personally relevant so far and really you know had loads of stuff that we can sort of take away and use in our own lives and they'll turn it into and now this is how we can save the world <laughs> and it's it's happened i mean you can back me up on this joke but it's mm. happened a lot hasn't it but what i liked about this is that he sort of did that but it, again it was in a very down-to-earth way and when we read books in the past you've the it's actually the authors have kind of lost a little bit of credibility with me when i reached the last chapters just because there there are ideas about how you can extrapolate their theories into the universe the universe yeah. have just been I don't know, they, they just haven't really worked. And it's been a little bit far-fetched um, from my perspective. But I, what I really liked about this is that he talked about three key things, and that was um, schooling and education in general, and then business and leadership, and working as part of a team. And, you know, even little, it, there are little bits in there about how to get the best out of your employees and things like that. Um, so I, I, really, I really enjoyed those sections, but I would also be interested to hear what other people thought about that too. Just, I agree with you that I think he, he whereas, I mean, I'm reminded of some of the other books that we've read, like we did um, a book called Authentic Happiness, which is about the um, positive psychology movement. And it makes a lot of sense all the way through the book and it's very down to earth. And then the last chapter is about how God is happiness and the universe is God. And it's just a bit like, whoa, where did this come from? What's, it, what's all this about? And it's sort of the last chapter often is where psychologists apply their their ideas to like the the universe and the big wide world and I thought Nathaniel Brandon does stay very down to earth and he does actually even what's interesting is that even knowing what we know about his uh, political views and his sort of uh, wider perspective on society he still kept this book very much focused on the personal and on the you know what you you can do in your life I think it's been a while since I've read the book but if my memory is correct, and please correct me if I'm if I'm wrong, uh, Brandon Nathaniel Brandon never. I mean, it, what I I take great um, solace from psychology books that 
as I'm reading it, I feel as if the author is sort of like my advocate and in a way passes their own judgment, not, not by being, um, you know, incredibly vocal or, or, um, emotional about it, but by stating, um, their belief in rights, right and wrong actions. And the one thing I, I've read several of Brandon's books, and what I I never seem to get from him, he provides a a map or a a lay of the land, but he never he, he seems to keep his own personal opinion or his own advocacy out of the out of the formula. If that I'm not sure if that makes sense. He never it, I don't ever get the impression he's like oh and by the way that that's really wrong that we're at a position now and or you're at a position now in your life where you have this massive, brittle, um, fragile, false self-esteem, which I'm now going to try to help you dismantle. Like there's no looking back to see how you got to that point. I agree with, well, actually, I don't want to say I agree because um, I I think I, I'm getting the essence of what you're saying in terms of um, how he doesn't really go into saying, yeah, this is this is really wrong or sort of almost empathizing with the with the severity of the situation is that am i getting what you're saying or is is it more of a is it a different thing no i, I think you're on to it <clears throat> um i'm trying to think of a specific example like it, nathaniel brandon himself is is pretty fabulous looking right i mean he's an older gentleman now but you know tan and fit and the the you know the brilliant smile and full head of hair and um the, i i think in a way that over the years really benefited him in, in the sense that society um, seems to be more accepting of a person's, um, th their body of work when they also happen to look fantastic. I'm, I'm not sure if that makes any sense, but he never, he, he doesn't seem to, it's not, it's not that it's self-correcting. It's that, um, it, within the issues of false self-esteem or narcissism, he rightfully points it out as unhealthy and the reasons why it doesn't promote true happiness. And he, and if I recall correctly, he even talks about false happiness versus genuine happiness. But it doesn't seem to be a model that he applies in – he doesn't even say in passing, and, you know, and by the way, you know, this is something that I experienced for a majority of my life or, you know, my parents valued – you know, model good looks and told me that it, it, I never got um, anything personal in, in that regard from, um, from his writings. And that's just one thought that crossed my mind as we were, as the talk was progressing. Do you think maybe the, um, like physical health and mental health are tied together, right? So, I mean, do you think that maybe like being self-aware helps people look better, I guess? Oh, without question, I think that a person who is, uh, yeah, that there's a certain carriage or posture or air and that it sort of infuses all walks of life or all the, all the different facets of a person's life. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I just wonder if, I wonder if those were tied together for Brandon, like if he was good looking because he was like mentally healthy and stuff. Oh, yeah, good. Certainly. Uh, uh, yes, absolutely. It's forgive me. I, I didn't even consider that. Well, I think it, there's there's two. Sorry to, to interrupt. but I was just going to no, say, please. I think there are two sides to it, because there is a kind of winning the genetic lottery side that, you know, if you're mm. um, if you're born with uh, looks that other people find attractive or you're, you know, you're born in Nathaniel Brandon's case, I think he's quite a tall guy and he's got, you know, very piercing blue eyes and he's quite, I think he's quite a good looking guy, but that that's one side, which is like whether or not you've kind of lucked out with your genetics, but there is another side, which I completely agree with. And that is how you look after yourself and how you hold yourself. And you can, I, I, I agree that you can, see a lot about someone's self-esteem in the way that they hold themselves and in the way that they uh, look after their body as well because it just sort of stands to reason that if you don't uh, 
esteem yourself, then you won't look after yourself. You know, you, you need to actually care about yourself and, and hold yourself in high regard in order to put in the effort that it takes to find, you know, a good balanced diet and to, to go and exercise and to, you know what I mean? So it's like, uh, I, I think there are two, two sides to it. I, I definitely agree that you can tell a lot about someone's self-esteem from, from their physical looks because you can tell how well they look after themselves. But there is also an element where, I don't know, if if Brandon was a really short, bald guy with, you know, who who didn't have teeth or something, then it might be it might be different, you know. Yeah, I I, I appreciate that point. It, it's always, um, it it's always a different. I mean, because you can put weight. I guess you can you can tell when someone's kind of overcompensating with the aspects of self care, perhaps to compensate for deficits in their own self-acceptance or whatever, right? Uh, but on the other hand, you can also see indicators of self-care as mm -hmm. as a sign that somebody loves and values themselves. So I don't know. I think that's often, so often we do that on a completely unconscious or subconscious basis. Like we'll look at somebody and say, oh yeah, that person looks healthy. I bet they're like a great, very balanced person. But we're integrating all these signals and we're not saying like, oh, their their nail polish is chipped and they've got a hair out of place, and so therefore I think they have gone down a point on the self esteem scale. <laughs> but uh, but somehow we do that in our in our brains, and we're not really even aware of it. Yeah, definitely. And do you do you? It's interesting because I got from what you're saying with the overcompensating idea that you see it also as as somebody who let's say um, you know is really obsessive about their physical um, health or physical appearance. That that's kind of, you know, going into low self-esteem in the other direction, so to speak. Is that what you're referring to? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, sure. it's there's not as strong of a need to get acceptance, I guess, from other people. That, based on something like looks, like people that don't really know you, they're just looking at you. I don't. I don't think there is such a need to have acceptance from those people if you have a very strong sense of self-acceptance. Yeah, absolutely. Claire's just said in the chat as well, I know many, many women with very low self-esteem who spend a lot of time and money on taking care of themselves because their whole self-worth is tied up in those things. And yeah, unfortunately, mm -hmm. I think that's a very common thing. And um, I, I did I have, I did see your previous comment, Claire, as well, about um, people not knowing what self-esteem is. And I think those two points are actually really nicely tied together because I think society as a whole, you know, when we... Not, not so much for us right now where we are in Mexico because it's quite a different culture, but, you know, in London, for example, or Brighton, where we're from, or the States, or anyway, you just walk outside your door and you're being bombarded by all this media and advertisements that are promoting, um, well, essentially promoting coping strategies for low self-esteem, um, as opposed to actual self-care strategies that would work on building your inherent self-esteem as opposed to kind of just putting a band-aid over it. Um, but yeah, just to go back to what Claire said earlier, because I thought this is a great point and I, I did want to talk about this as well, um, because Nathaniel actually mentions it in the book. She said, I think the issue is that a lot of people do not actually know what self-esteem is and can sometimes confuse it with narcissism if you are someone who has a high level of self-esteem. And there's a point in the book quite early on, I think, where Nathaniel Brandon actually says, you know, people often ask him, can someone have too much self-esteem? And he says, no, you can never have too much self-esteem. Um, and how he, he also talks about how, you know, if you are someone with high self-esteem, um, there are people who might not like that because they, uh, this is paraphrasing, but because they, I think they view it as a threat basically, or they don't recognize it as high self-esteem because it's not something that they personally have themselves. The phrase that comes to mind, which sort of describes this, is the um, tall poppy syndrome. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the idea that um, uh, people kind of get threatened by uh, the tall poppy that stands out from the crowd, so to speak. And and I think, unfortunately, that, that does, that you do see that happening. And uh, uh, I guess one of the things that's really special in life is if you find people who are outside that, you know, who don't apply that to you, that, I think that's for me, one of the marks of true friendship is when you know that um, your friends um, are 
uh, supportive of your increases in self-esteem rather than being threatened by them. Yeah, I, I remember several points where Nathaniel Brandon was talking about this idea in relationships where, you know, one person would feel threatened by the other or just feel threatened by the other gender in general or something. I mean, his, his writing is pretty, like, heteronormative, but um, he'll say often things about, like, you know, uh, women feeling threatened by men or men feeling threatened by women or partners feeling threatened by one another. And I thought that was interesting. And it also, um, it, it also like just really brought out the point for me that Brandon talked about relationships, love and sex, like so much more explicitly and so much more than Ayn Rand did. And I just thought that was really interesting because, you know, um, they were together for quite a while, you know, they were lovers, but she didn't really seem to have a lot to say about those things publicly in the way that he did, you know? I don't know about anyone else, if anyone else has anything they want to say about this, but with Ayn Rand, for example, the only times that I heard her, you know, quote, talk about love, sex, or relationships was through her fiction. And that was pretty disturbing from my point of view anyway. I mean, the way that she portrayed relationships in the two novels of hers that I've read, which is Atlas Shrugged and The Fountainhead, was not what I would necessarily define as a healthy relationship or a high self-esteem relationship. So I think that is an interesting yeah. point. Yeah. Go ahead, Deb, with your thoughts. I wanted to hear what you had to say, too. Yeah, I would definitely like to hear um, any criticisms you have. Yeah, thanks. Um, well, you know, I've, 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 the first thought that comes to my head is that I don't see Nathaniel Brandon as someone who is that strong on the side of the child um, or, and this is, and I, I'm sort of apprehensive to say that because it's, I, I'm pretty, I'm, it may be mixed up with my own sort of, um, you, like these things that I'm really sort of protective or defensive about in my mind about how it's really important to empathize with ourselves in the past and, um, how we are, so, like, um, I guess I say we in general, but I mean, how a lot of people are sort of traumatized in our in our childhood, and how much that really impacts us. And he does talk about that a lot, a lot more than he did, I think, in the psychology of self-esteem, and um, in this book. Like, one of the things that he said in the like around in, like the beginning of the book was sort of like, um, you know, there are just, you know, there are these people who are completely unaffected by trauma and they're they're untouchable I, I don't know I don't find it as strong as it could be his sort of position and he also on on short on trauma and also he says something like in the in the end of the book around the end about how there are heroic children who cho who choose to you know sort of rise above and detach themselves from their environment I felt a lot of, um, I guess, anger when I read that, but I'm not entirely sure why I felt so angry about that. When I read that he, like, he was sort of, like, um, exalting the, the heroism of children who detach from their environment in, in a sort of healthy way because they're able to see past. Um, but th that's just my general ideas and feelings. I don't have any clear sort of cut out thought. So if you guys want to chime in on that, I would really like to hear it because I'm, I'm, I'm pretty unclear about that. So, yeah. Thank you for sharing your thoughts about that. I think it's really interesting. I know Jake wanted to say something, but just quickly on what you were, the very last point that you were making. Um, I mean, what came up for me as you were talking about it is that I guess, and I, I wonder if this is the same for you, is that I guess if you read or you perceive that he's sort of exalting these kids who were quote heroic in his words and were sort of untouched by anything that happened to them in childhood and still managed to rise above um, all the others and the implication in there is that the ones who were affected by what happened to them in childhood is that they're unheroic um, and I, I wondered if that's perhaps why you felt even though he doesn't actually say that that is sort of implied by the use of the word heroic for these children I definitely agree with what you had to say I think that was really well articulated from like your perspective yeah, I, I also wanted to say I think it's a really, really um, important and, and uh, interesting uh, uh, aspect of the book that you're that you're um, picking out there, Deborah, because it really is very different to a lot of the other books we've covered in Psychology Book Club. So, for example, um, Alice Miller and um, John Bradshaw and other people like that who are very much focused on 
the impact of um, childhood uh, mistreatment or abuse on the self-esteem of of people and how that affects you into adult life. And what I get from Nathaniel Brandon is that he's so much focused on the importance of taking self-responsibility that he downplays um, the childhood aspect. And you're right, I, I also noticed that he mentioned it more in this book and he does say, um, I can't remember the exact phrasing, but a number of times he says, if you are abusive towards children, you will, you, you know, you will actually... Um, uh, make life a lot harder for them and so forth but he doesn't uh, but he's i think he's very much his interest is very much on getting his readers and his um therapy clients to take self-responsibility and i think this is a bit of a tension in these books in all of these books um between recognizing childhood trauma and taking self-responsibility as an adult, because at the one end of it, if you get really focused on your childhood trauma, and this is like in an unbalanced way, so to speak, then uh, I guess Nathaniel Brandon, his concern would be that you become so focused on that that you're not actually uh, doing what you can to take control of your life as an adult. And on the other end of the spectrum, if you just look at, oh, well, I've got to take control and take self-responsibility without understanding where your self-esteem uh, challenges come from, which is for you know the vast majority of people from childhood experiences, then you don't really understand what you're doing and what your unconscious motivations are. So I think there's a bit of a tension in all of these books between, you know, well, how much should we really focus on the the root of the problems that we have with self-esteem in childhood versus how much should we focus on being self-responsible now and and what's the balance between those? It's a balance between focusing on understanding the past and understanding how your past has shaped your present and then also being able to move forward as well and sort of take the responsibility, the self-responsibility that Brandon is talking about into the future too. I know, and I, I don't think it was in Six Pillars, that Brandon's talked about, like, the purpose of the, or what the parents can do for the child, of course, is the child can't, you can't give a child self-esteem, but you can get rid of kind of the the blockades that get in the way of, of a child developing, you know, high self-esteem or whatever. Um, but yeah, in general, I, I, I agree, Deb. In fact, I didn't really think about it until you pointed it out that, um, like Ayn Rand, he almost talks nothing about children, I, at least I feel, overall. I mean, maybe he makes little points here and there, but that was one of my biggest problems with objectivism when I first learned about it was that it said nothing about why you have a family and like what's the point of a family and things like that. And I was kind of hoping to find more of that with Brandon. And while there was still some nice abstract points that weren't inaccurate, uh, yeah, I, I find that kind of kind of missing. But I agree with Hannah that, you know, like this is this this book has a different maybe a different directive to it. I wanted to say, Deb, I think, thank you for bringing up that point because I, I definitely also think it's really important. And the thing about a heroic child who kind of like dissociates from their environment, like I think that maybe one reason why it also could have bothered you is that, you know, it's not really heroic. Like children who are in environments don't really have much like, of course, you have no control over the environment that you're born into. And also, like, a lot of that is, like, as far as how resilient children are to trauma, a lot of that is genetic. It's not a choice. And some people are just kind of more resilient than others in, in whatever way. And often, you know, children will choose, like, uh, I don't know, will choose to go away, like, just not really as a conscious choice, just as a kind of survival mechanism. So I don't know if it, it could really accurately be called heroic. Like obviously they're uh obviously they're, you know, they're dealing with <laughs> the circumstances that they were they happen to be born into in the best way that they know how. Uh but yeah, I mean I, I don't know. Is that word like putting more responsibility on the child than the child has or maybe should have. Yeah, I 
I really appreciated what you had to say about that because I, I think the moment you said like it's not really heroic, um, that sort of clicked with me in a way because um, it's sort of I think it does imply a lot more responsibility on the child than there should be. It's just this idea that um, yeah we we all cope we all try to like survive in childhood and um, I guess it's not I don't want to belittle people sort of ability to sort of see the future and see that there is more. I, I find that really admirable. But I think the, that use of the word particularly is just, it, it doesn't, I, I mean, for someone who, like, if I would see myself and think, oh, yeah, I, I sort of conformed or, you know, kind of, I, I caved in in those moments, it's sort of like, I, I guess it brings on self-attack for, for me in my own mind. But um, because in a way, it, it, there is that implication that you should have done it differently or you weren't heroic. And when it really, I don't know, really wasn't that, that case or something like that, like more when I was a, like a little kid or something like that. So, yeah, yeah I, I think it is quite misleading to bring terms like heroic into it in the first place, because really it's, it's nothing to do with heroism in the way that we perceive it as a culture. And it's, it's more to do with survival. And everybody right. has, you know, Stephanie was saying, everybody has different levels of resilience, also different ways of coping with things based on genetic makeup and also what kind of environment they're in and what triggers there are in that environment. And so to, like, I, I definitely, I, I can definitely see why that put up a huge red flag for you because thinking about it now, um, even introducing words like heroic and labels like that, because that's essentially what it is and judgment values is, I think quite misleading and not especially helpful because like you were saying it, it kind of makes you look and look back at your own reaction to things that you cope with during your childhood and think oh well does that mean I wasn't heroic then because I mean I can certainly look back and say well by Nathaniel Brandon's standards I don't think I was a particularly heroic child then but I also don't think that that is necessarily a poor reflection on me because I was kind of you know I was doing the best that I could at the time right yeah right. Can I just add something on to um, the, the point that you were making before, Deborah, about this question of Nathaniel Brandon and his treatment of self-responsibility versus um, children? It, it strikes me that it's also a little bit similar to um, the kind of two different views of self-esteem that we were talking about earlier, the ones that are more focused on self-acceptance and the ones that are more focused on self-responsibility and because because Nathaniel Brandon is very much on the self-responsibility end it strikes me that if you go too far just focusing on on that side then uh, it makes it very difficult to have self-compassion and self-understanding because when you're a child you're not you don't have self-responsibility in the same way you know because kids kids are in that stage where they are basically uh, vulnerable and they and they are kind of uh, subject to whatever it is that their parents are the conditions that their parents are, are putting them in but on the other hand so that's why I think Nathaniel Brandon is really trying to focus on the self-responsibility side but on the other hand if you if you go um, too far into the self-acceptance side I think it can be very helpful in terms of understanding and self-compassion about what has happened to us all in childhood but I guess the risk that Nathaniel Brandon is trying to kind of, um, uh, I guess, argue against is that it makes it hard to then actually become active and sort of take control of one's life in, in adult life. And I think both of those things in the extreme, um, they can be limitations. So like I know that there is a temptation when thinking about my childhood and thinking about sort of the things that, that occurred to, uh, to me as a kid, there is a temptation to focus on that and to kind of lose track of what I can do in my life now and to be sort of responsible now. And I also know that there is a temptation if I focus very much on what I can do now to lack compassion or empathy for myself when I have difficulty doing some things. It's like you're either treating yourself in Nathaniel, in one extreme, if you go fully onto the focus of, on self-responsibility, then the risk is that you become a bit like a drill instructor for yourself. Like, you know, you've got to get on and do this and take responsibility and go for it, you know? And if you go too much in the other end where you, you lose the self-responsibility, you, you can get lost in, uh, I suppose, feeling more like a victim and finding it difficult to be 
assertive about what you can do with your life. I think that's a great point. But I, I had one more question, like one question about like to the people who sort of who have worked on the sentence completions you, in the book, um, would you have any like tips or any sort of things that you did to, to make the sentence completions work for you? When you say making yeah. them work for you, is there anything in particular, like, like a specific obstacle that you've come up against? Yeah, I think there's the sheer amount of sentences that exist, like the sentence stem. Um, I guess I think there's there are a lot, and I sort of I'm looking at it in terms of like I haven't done the sentence completions for this book, mm. and I've bookmarked them so I can go back like when I'm done, like when, since I'm done, I can just go like you know see okay what pillar do I want to work on now mm. but um I guess I just in terms of um because I it's like I've tried sentence completions before his his sentence completions that were available on his site but they were like I would take really long with them and they would it would be so many like the the volume of them and I just yeah. I guess sifting through that has been sort of um it's it's I guess it's difficult for it's been difficult for me but um so yeah, I guess it's, uh, the, my main thing is like just the volume and how you kind of go about choosing uh, what you want to work on, or if if you if you have that sort of experience. But um, I guess yeah. it's pretty unique to me, maybe. <laughs> so. No, I, I I definitely I mean the word that came up for me when I I thought about some of my experiences with his um, free sentence completions on his website was like feeling a bit overwhelmed, and um, it sounds like maybe that was what you're getting at as well. And I think it is, especially those ones, because he has a very rigid structure for how you should do them. And I think even when you should do them, it feels quite constricting in some ways as well. For me, what's important is to do however much you feel comfortable with and however much you feel, you know, what you think is going to be most helpful to you. That sounds good. So sort of kind of taking it at my own pace as opposed to sort of that structure, which can kind of take away from the connecting with yourself if, if there's like that sort of pressure there to keep going sometimes it could help but yeah, just particularly for me the thing that i always take from these books is the sort of cherry picking approach yeah so what one thing that i really appreciate about these books is being able to cherry pick the things that work for me and kind of leave the things that don't and i i don't think that any, I mean, my, my general approach to these things is that I don't think that anyone necessarily has the way to live or the right answer to any of these things, because they're all such personal experiences, like self-esteem is such a personal experience, and um, how you want to do sentence completion is such a personal experience, that the guidelines are useful, but my, my overall approach is just do what works for you. <laughs> cool. Cool. I just wanted to add something to that quickly. Um, uh, while you were talking about it, I was thinking about my experience with journaling, um, which I think is maybe one of the other, is similar in some ways to the question about sort of how to get the most out of the sentence completion. For me, I know when I started doing um, journaling, I didn't really know whether or not it was, quote, working, so to speak. You know, I got a sense of like, well, I don't really know what what the point of this is or what what's going to come out and i think when you start sentence completion it can be a bit like that too sort of like you know there's, a, there's quite a lot to do and you're not really sure whether or not it's kind of effective or anything like that and at least my experience has been that if you just carry on it gets more it, it starts to get more and more useful and interesting as long as you don't worry about or care about sort of whether or not it's quote working so to speak and that i think is where at least for me when i stopped worrying about that that's when i was really freed up my creativity in terms of just writing stuff that was deep down in my on my mind but with that i wasn't really in touch with and that's where it got more interesting because then i found myself writing things that i could actually use as a real help to self-reflect about you know what i was concerned about what's on my mind things that I hadn't really acknowledged that are important to myself. And I think it might be the same with sentence, sentence completion that, um, you know, I guess the, the key thing for me is is not to effectively just not to worry about it and just, just basically whatever comes out comes out and you just kind of see after a while, I think you ease into it and, mm -hmm. and it becomes more creative and more useful. Is that your experience too? Yeah, absolutely. And just on a really 
personal level, I'm not sure if this is necessarily what's going to work for you, but my, my overall approach to books like this is just to take them a, a chapter at a time, because what I figure is that they're broken up into those chapters for a reason. And generally there is a, like a logical sequence <laughs> as well, hopefully a logical sequence that sort of ties them all together it means that the, you know, chapter two, the content in chapter two and the exercise in chapter two are a follow on from chapter one, etc. So I, I found that helpful. I do understand it can feel quite overwhelming sometimes. I guess recognizing the overwhelm, but not getting, not letting yourself be controlled by it is really helpful. Yeah. yeah. I had uh, massive blocks when it came to those sentence completion exercises because of a pretty powerful internal critic, which basically would just, you know, scream at me, you know, boring, uninteresting, you know, stupid, don't, you know, whatever I was trying to express or whatever thought would come up that I would have the impulse to write down would get shouted down. So um, I actually can't, I don't even remember how I came across this, but um, saying to yourself, I found this very helpful in other avenues as well. If you, if that comes up for you, if I have not the, the thought or the impulse, I have nothing to say that's important comes up or this is too difficult. Well, I'll, I'll do two. The first is I have nothing to say that's important. I say to myself, I complete, I understand and I agree. You have nothing to say, which is important. But if you did have something important to say, what would that be? Like, let's just, you know, let's just pretend you have something important to say. What would that look like? That's a great and, question. <laughs> and that somehow short circuited that and allowed me, it gave me permission, you know, oh, okay, well, if I did, this is what I would say. I'm not saying it is, but if I did, this is, and I've, I've used that in a couple different areas artistically that, and it's really been very um, helpful to me. That's cool. Um, it's, I really like that. It's, um, yeah, it just, I, I really like that idea of sort of saying, yeah, so what do you think is important? Yeah, just like corresponding with yourself. Yeah, you just say, you just say, well, if you did have something, well, you know, if you could write a poem, what would it look like? Or if you could draw this chair, you know, what, how would it look? It just, it's a, for me, it was a very in, in, um, invigorating exercise because it, it's not that I wasn't doing it. It's hard to describe, but looking back on it, it, it was a kind of short circuit of that internal criticism or those, te those um, freeze ups or tension that would occur when confronted with genuinely expressing you know, in, and in a record that could be, you know, when you're writing it down, that can be read, right? Someone can find that someone else, you know, it's out there in, in, even if it's a private journal, so that, um, there was a certain tension that would come up for me when I, when, um, when I asked myself to do it. I think that's a, I really, really love that. And, um, I think it works for sentence completion as well. Cause I guess if you, if you sit down and do sentence completion, you're like, oh, I don't know what the answer is to this time. You can turn that around to yourself and say, well, if you did know the answer, what would it be? <laughs> exactly. Right. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. I love that. Cause it, it, what I really like about it as well is there is in asking yourself that question, there is this inherent trust that you do have all the answers that you need and you know, it's just a question of getting past whatever's blocking you to get to that answer. So yeah, I really, really like that approach. It's nice too, because it overcomes the, I've got nothing important to say. Yes, you have. No, I haven't. Yes, you have. No, I haven't. <laughs> because it, like the way that you phrased it, Dave, it's like, yes, I agree. You've got nothing. For, but if you did have, and so it's kind of, it, yeah. it, it gets, in a sense, it kind of gets around and short circuits your barrier. Right. Thank you for sharing that. That's great. Well, we've been talking for an hour and a quarter now, so I just wanted to ask if anyone else has anything that they want to say or comment on before we wrap up. Um, I'd just thanks. like to say thanks to you all uh, for the feedback and the questions and stuff like that. I enjoyed talking. Yeah, this was great. Thank you so much for this forum. Really enjoyed it. Yeah, I had a great time too. So thank you so much for participating and coming along today and for all your insightful and high self-esteem comments. <laughs> yeah, I really enjoyed it too. The next book is on Sunday the 7th of July because we're doing these bi-monthly at the moment and that is called In the Realm of Hungry Ghosts by Gabor Mate. It's a lot. Great. Well, thank you so much all for coming today. I really, really enjoyed this conversation. And as I said earlier, I'm now looking forward to going away and reading Honoring the Self. 
so yeah, I hope you all have a great afternoon slash evening, wherever you are. And I'll see you next time. Bye. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye. <laughs> Thanks for listening to this episode of the Becoming Who You Are podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please head over to iTunes and leave a review. You can get in touch with Hannah by emailing H-A-N-N-A-H at becomingwhoyouare.net. Don't forget to visit becomingwhoyouare.net and find out how you can use rational personal development to live an authentic life.